My name is Denise Barkey, and I'm the Executive Director and Co-Founder of HCU Network America, as well as an adult home assistant area patient. I want to thank you for attending HCU Network America and PKU News Back to School Low Protein Community Virtual Chat. We have a wonderful lineup of panelists planned for tonight. Before I turn over the mic, I would like to take care of some housekeeping items. There we go. This webinar is being recorded. Um, so by default, everyone's microphones and cameras are off except for our panelists and co-hosts. If you have a question, please use the Q&A or raise hand feature. All questions will be answered after, after the panelists have gone. With that said, I'd like to turn it over to my wonderful co-host, uh, Sarah Chamberlain. Hi, everyone. <laughs> As Danae said, I'm Sarah Chamberlain. I'm the Executive Director of National PKU News, and I'm so glad so many people have joined us tonight. Um, obviously a hot topic, whether you're going back to school in your living room or, uh, or in some sort of a school building, there's a lot of questions that people have, and hopefully I think we have an amazing lineup of panelists who um, can, can help answer some of your questions. Danae, can you go to the next slide real quick? So um, I do want to give a shout out to PKU News' COVID care grant program. If you are experiencing financial difficulties, child care difficulties, anything that's, that the pandemic has put a strain on your ability to get low protein foods, you can apply for a grant for $150 of Cambrook Foods. Um, some of that actually donated by Cambrook itself, but we've raised um, a lot of money from um, a lot of really generous partners to provide that and also to subsidize how much fee subscriptions. So please check that out if you are in need. Um, I know we have a lot of PKU families on here, but we also have families from other disorders. Um, how much fee, I, I made this little flyer, <laughs> don't let the fee fool you, um, because we have unrounded protein in how much fee for over 9,000 foods. A lot thanks to the work of, of Jen, um, who you'll hear from later. And um, it's really a great tool for anyone on a low protein diet. It doesn't necessarily, necessarily have to be PKU. So I just encourage you, um, that comes with the COVID care grant. So if you're interested, check it out. Um, and the only thing I wanted to mention um, is our Go Low Pro app, which is a low protein grocery and restaurant locator. It's been in a bit of a slump of late. Uh, nothing like launching a restaurant locator right before a pandemic. Um, but Danae, was, Danae suggested I mention it particularly because it does have a lot of um, store locations for low protein foods. So as things get harder to find, um, that's one resource that's available to you. Um, I am going to now read our disclaimer. Disclaimer, exclamation point. This meeting is not meant to replace the advice of your medical team, and you should consult them before changing anything. And with that, uh, I'll toss it back to Danae for our first panelist. All right, so our first panelist is uh, Dr. Carrie Harding. Dr. Harding is an associate professor in the Department of Molecular and Medical Genetics and Pediatrics at Oregon Health and Science University. He is a board certified in pediatrics, clinical genetics, and biochemical genetics. Um, and he also works, sorry, in the metabolic, metabolic clinic at, oh, I should know how to pronounce this, uh, Children's Hospital uh, Dome Betcher, he can correct me on that, and is the medical director of the Biomedical Genetics Laboratory in the Knight Diagnostic Laboratories at OAS. OHSU. Um, with that, I'm turning it over to Dr. Hardy. Thanks so much, uh, Danae, for that. Um, are you running my slides or am I? You um, got them incorporated? I can advance them if, if you want. That's fine. Um, so um, I have a brief introduction about uh, COVID-19. I assume most people, unless you've been living under a rock, have heard more than you care to hear about COVID-19 at this point. I wish I had been living under a rock for a while now, but that unfortunately hasn't been the case. Next slide, please. 
Um, so this has gone by a couple of different names. COVID-19 is actually sort of the second major virus like it that's come out of uh, China originally. It has another name, SARS-CoV-2. Um, first reported, it seems like decades ago, but no, it's not even been a year. Um, first reported in China back in December. Started out in most patients as primarily a respiratory illness, but it can cause other problems. Quite a few people have diarrhea as a first major manifestation and the respiratory symptoms hit days later. And a lot of the fatal complications actually come from um, stroke and heart problems. And what I don't have on here is that there are quite a few patients that have neurologic symptoms from this. Next um, slide. And this is up to date as of 4 a.m. this morning. Um, the uh, Johns Hopkins University, you can, if you're really into this, you can look every day and see this map. Uh, they update the incidence of cases. Now, you have to trust that the governments are, these various places are reporting all their cases, which of course is suspect even of our own government, I'll have to admit, but, um, and that they're testing as many patients as they, as they could, but as of this morning, there have been 22 million cases and 781,000 people that have thought to have died from um, COVID infection, which is, to me, pretty staggering. Next. Um, uh, the deaths are the tip of the iceberg. Uh, and there are probably millions more that have been infected but have never been tested because they either had really, really mild symptoms or perhaps were just completely asymptomatic. So the good news is, is that the vast majority of people have very mild symptoms, maybe even more again, that don't have any symptoms at all. And so of course this becomes, this is the, 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 the status or the reason for the big debate, right? About where you should go in public, whether you should wear a mask, whether you should go back to school. It's not that everybody going back to school is gonna get sick or die. It's spreading this to other people who might sick, become sick or die. And that's really the crux of the argument. And I'm not gonna get into that debate too much. It's really the risk at the top, right? Who, who's gonna get sick? Who's, who, who might potentially have a, might have a lethal outcome. Uh, and that tip of the iceberg uh, has, been a, has been pretty static. It's been between two and three, 4% in every country that uh, has had this. Um, Next slide. So there have been several published series since, you know, most of, I assume the audience are mostly people that have children with uh, inborn errors. I went specifically looking for literature on the incidence of this disease in children. There have been now several series of the viral infection in kids in China, Europe, and just recently a couple from a couple of different institutions, mostly back east. Um, and there, we don't know the overall incidence of the disease because there hasn't been widespread mass population testing, but there's a somewhat lower percentage of children that become severely ill, but it does not mean that there are not children with severe disease. And there's a particularly interesting, very complicated, um, rare disorder that's very different than what we're seeing in adults. Um, that at, be at the beginning, no one recognized was COVID-19, but now is a, a recognized syndrome. But, so the chances of children becoming severely ill are probably a little bit lower. The death rate's a little bit unclear still because there's just been so few, but it's probably a lot lower than that two to 3% that in the overall population. And as is, has been true in adults, the uh, risk of severe complications is also higher in kids with pre-existing conditions. And the ones that have been specifically called out in these series are listed here, kids with asthma, kids with pre-existing blood disease. So the places in China and in Italy where there's lots of people who have sickle cell disease or thalassemia, these are blood diseases that are common there. These are individuals who um, showed up frequently in the emergency rooms there. Kids who had diabetes, kids who had cancer, kids who had immunosuppression. So, so this is a particular issue for some of our disorders um, where say liver transplant has been a common treatment. So those individuals are in, on immunosuppressive drugs and they are at particular risk from uh, becoming infected from COVID-19. There is no data that children are more likely to get infection. 
um, than anybody else, but they can obviously become infected. They just don't tend to get as sick as adults in general. Next, next slide. So what is there known about COVID-19 and inborn errors of metabolism? There's actually extremely little actual data. There's only been two publications that have even mentioned this. There is a single pediatric case. Uh, it's not mentioned in the paper that discusses it, but I know from colleagues in Italy that this was a child with propionic acidemia who came in with a metabolic crisis uh, and was COVID-19 positive. So they presume that it was the COVID-19 infection that triggered the metabolic crisis, just like any infection could in propionic acidemia. Uh, I am aware of an adult with a long chain fatty acid oxidation disorder who presented with a, a muscle breakdown episode, which is typical of, typical of that disease, turned out to be COVID-19 positive. It's likely that the COVID-19 uh, precipitated that illness uh, in that patient. That's uh, as yet an unpublished observation. So uh, those are the only two that I know of so far. There may be others that have yet been unreported. There is an ongoing survey it's out there from some of the rare disease consortia trying to collect more information about the impact of COVID-19. So we don't have very much data. My suggestion is from talking with lots of different metabolic people around the world is that we do not think that individuals with inborn errors of metabolism are more likely to get COVID-19 than anybody else. Um, and whether they get sicker from any from this is probably just related to what their underlying condition is. So these are my recommendations, and I think they jive with most of what the metabolic societies are saying, which is, first off, you need to follow what the local guidelines or the CDC guidelines are for what you should do in terms of isolation and protection in your local region, and that really depends upon whether you've got a lot of active infections going on in, in your area. Uh, it, again, we don't think that having an inborn error makes it more likely that you'll become infected. Your risk of getting infected is the same as anybody else's. Um, and probably inborn errors that are typically not life-threatening probably don't need extra precautions. So we're not aware of anybody with things like PKU or homocystinuria having uh, any extra problems with their disease because they've become COVID infected. However, diseases where we know that infection can trigger life-threatening metabolic crises, like organic acidemias, like urea cycle disorders and MSUD, you might wanna consider stronger, stricter isolation to prevent that initial infection, at least until there's a vaccine available. And just like we do for all other vaccines, we strongly encourage as a field, anyone to take advantage of a vaccination program. The caveat there being obviously, we don't have a vaccine and there are trials going on. Um, we need to have a safe, effective vaccine before we as a, you know, as a group are gonna recommend that vaccination be, uh, be done. Um, next slide. Uh, so, just like you've been hearing for six months now, uh, if you're sick, you stay home, you wash your hands, try not to rub your eyes or your mouth, and wear your mask. That's the biggest thing that uh, anybody can do to stop the spread of uh, any, any virus, but including COVID-19. That's, I think that's all I have. Great. Thank you, Dr. Harding. Um, before I introduce the next speaker, I'm going to do something I forgot to do at the beginning, which is launch a poll. Uh, this is mostly going to be helpful for the speakers later on. Um, it's just two questions. How is your child going back to school and what age or grade is your child in? Um, just to give us a little more information. Um, you can vote as we talk at your leisure. Um, and with that, I will introduce the next speaker, which is um, Benjamin Goodlett. He is a psychologist who lives in Boston, a clinical psychologist working in the Division of Genetics at Boston Children's Hospital. His hospital, his passion is helping families balance medical needs with everyday life. 
In his clinical work, he provides neuropsych evaluations to children and adults affected by inborn errors of metabolism. He's actively involved in basic and clinical trial research to link the biochemical impact acts of, new, of inborn errors of metabolism to cognitive, emotional, and social functioning. Take it away. Hi, thank you so much. So Danae had asked um, if I could speak a little bit about what I do in terms of the clinical work because not all sites are fortunate enough to have a neuropsychologist. And so um, one of the roles that I play that's really important is trying to think about what behaviors we see from a person, whether it be difficulty finding things, difficulty remembering instructions that they were just given, maybe it's difficulty in academics, and then trying to think about what does that tell us about their brain functioning and how their metabolic condition might be impacting them. And the way that we try to measure that is through a neuropsychological evaluation. And you might have had yourself or your children might have had very similar evaluations through school. We call those a uh, psychoeducational evaluation, or you might have gone to a private clinic and had a psychological evaluation. And those are all very similar, but with slightly different goals. In the school, they're trying to understand how do things like memory or learning skills relate to, or how do like language or memory relate to learning skills. But in the hospital setting, we're often more interested in how do things like language or memory skills relate to what's happening with the person's brain. We can go to the next slide. So what does that look like? Typically a neuropsychological evaluation is multiple visits. First, hopefully there'll be an introduction. You'll get to know who's the person that's gonna do the evaluation and get a sense of what's gonna happen. There's an interview first. Uh, if it's with an adult, it's with the adult. If it's a child, usually it might be a parent only interview. Uh, there might be more than one interview where the psychologist talks to other people like a teacher or another adult familiar with the person that's going to be evaluated. And the heart of it is really the one-on-one -on -one testing. And so this often looks like two people sitting across the table from each other and engaging activities. Some of them look like school activities to find these vocabulary words. Others look like puzzles or solving things using colored blocks. And it's really important that these evaluations be specific to the person. And depending on the question, depending on the age of the child, the time needed can really be quite variable. A relatively short one can maybe be a two hour evaluation, or you could have an all day or multi-visit appointment where it might take up to eight hours of face-to-face -face time if there's really complicated questions. And then there's feedback. So after uh, an evaluation, then the family should get information on what were the results. And that would include everything from just in general, how did it seem like the person was doing, but then specific to the questions that prompted the evaluation. Again, if it was attention, what are the different components of attention that were measured? How was the performance of the person that was tested? And what does that tell us about how they're functioning in their day-to-day -day life. And then there's a report that comes along with it and that should summarize the findings as well as any recommendations. And that's a bit of a thing that's unique about the evaluations that psychologists do, whether it's in the school or whether it's in private practice or whether it's in the hospital, is that there should be a, a report that is readable to the family that explains what the findings are, what the recommendations are, and again, the different settings will might have a different focus. In the school, it might be how are the different mental or cognitive abilities related to the different school functioning. In the hospital, it might be more along the lines of how is the different mental abilities related to their medical condition. And let's go on to the next one. So why might someone want one of these evaluations? What is the utility of it? One of the big things is to help with diagnosis. So in particular, um, parents of children will often have a question about whether or not ADHD is a relevant diagnosis, but there's plenty of other diagnoses that we could be considering as well. Second, a neuropsychological evaluation might be used to look at the impact of different medical treatments. So traditionally that might be used in things like neurosurgery 
or cancer treatment. But in the world of inborn errors of metabolism, we might be wondering if somebody's fee goes from 20 milligrams per deciliter down to four, does that have an impact on their attention? Does it have an impact on their memory? Likewise, for somebody with homocystinuria, if they have sustained homocysteine levels for an extended period of time, does that cause them problems? And so by having evaluations over time, we can understand the impact of their medical treatment, or at least try to understand it better. Another reason why somebody might have one of these types of evaluations is a comparison to future performance. This is particularly relevant when we think of neurodegenerative conditions like dementia, where there might be an accumulation of problems over time that happen really slowly. So it might be easy to miss day to day that there's changes that have happened. But when we take a big picture approach, we can see that there's really been a big change. We can be used to assess daily functioning. How do things like attention or memory impact just your ability to function in the world, like to drive a car? It could also be really helpful for treatment planning. There's plenty of times where somebody will come for an evaluation for me and it'll turn out that they're doing just fine in terms of memory or visual spatial skills. But you know what? Maybe they have some depression and that's been impacting their ability to do the things that they need to do. And so it's referral to therapy that's helpful for them. Or maybe ADHD did turn out to be a relevant diagnosis and a referral to a psychiatrist for medication management as a result. Um, and so again, there are lots of people that provide evaluations that are psychologists in a school setting, in private practice, in hospitals. But in our clinic, it's our strong recommendation that people with inborn errors of metabolism should at least have periodic consideration for whether or not this is relevant for them. Uh, and I think for homocystinuria in particular, um, having one of these evaluations on some sort of schedule is an important part of understanding how functioning is changing or staying the same over time. And that's it for my slides. All right, thank you so much, Ben, uh, for that wonderful presentation and overview about how uh, neurocognitive testing um, or neuropsych evaluation can help benefit uh, the patients. Um, our next speaker is Jennifer Beezer. Um, Jennifer is a metabolic uh, dietitian. She has been um, practicing metabolic nutrition for about 15 years and has worked in both the hospital clinic and it, um, is now with PKU News. So Jen, you are up and just let me know when you'd like me to advance the slides. Go ahead and advance. That would be great. Uh, oh, I'm getting your internet is unstable. There you go. Okay, we'll try to I'll try to stay in line here. It's been a little little rocky internet day here in everyone's on online school in Boise. <laughs> um, so I want to talk about um, approaching meals in school. Uh, Brenda's going to talk about some uh, ideas of what to send and then of course Lynn has the back to school program with Hamburg Foods. So um, I'm going to talk about sort of how do we function in the school setting and get what we need for ourselves or for our kiddos. So I like to say last for the low hanging fruit, no pun intended, um, but most schools have a nice salad bar with um, a variety of fresh vegetables. They have a requirement to serve fruits and vegetables every day of those boys on the menu. And some schools even have a couple of choices for which fruit to take during the day. So there's some, there's some good choices there. And one um, accommodation that can be really simple is to ask that your child be allowed to take double portion of the fruits and vegetables, in particular those that are lower in feet. Um, so it helps them balance throughout, balance their requirements throughout the whole, the whole day and not just get a whole lot of feet at school for dinner. Um, some 
really common asks are to think of things that kids with food allergies might need. So um, gluten-free bread, um, sometimes the school district can reference of which bread they're already buying. So if that one works, that's because they're already, they see it as a win, they don't have to buy a different product, they might need to buy a little bit more, but they're already buying it. Um, and they all, all schools should have the existing plan for, for gluten foods. It's so common now that um, I don't think I've ever run into a school kitchen that didn't already have a gluten-free bread available. Um, milk. So the milk substitution, milk is a tricky requirement because the school uh, nutrition programs require, require that each student take a milk in order for that, that meal to be reimbursed by the USDA. So that's why we always hear about milk. But they meet that requirement by having a milk substitute for those who need it. Again, the schools are already buying this. It, it may not be the brand that your kiddo is used to, so there might be some some struggle there, some, some new learning, but have a milk substitute. A lot of them will have a soy milk, um, but more commonly now, I'm seeing rice milk or almond. So what they're already doing and, and try to start there. Next slide, please. There we go. So um, the first thing to do is to ask for some of those accommodations, um, get any of the necessary paperwork and forms that you might need, and then um, be prepared to send your formula with your, um, maybe that you, maybe you keep an extra can at the school or some of the ready to drink formulas, um, just in case they're, formula gets spilled and they can't drink any of it because it's, it's all gone. Um, have, a, have a backup plan for the teachers. Um, most teachers will allow, especially in elementary school, for the kids to, to have a stock of snacks and kind of goodies for parties. And, you know, as we all know, a lot of times the birthday parties are surprised. We forgot until the last day before that we needed to or wanted to take in treats for the class. So have something there because it's going to happen that your kid gets there and there's some sort of celebration or party that wasn't anticipated. Um, I also like to end that <coughs> excuse me <coughs> that you chat with your kiddo. <coughs> Let me take a drink. Sorry about that. Chat with them about where they want to drink their formula. <coughs> they may not want to drink it in their classroom. They won't even go to the <coughs> kitchen or nurse's office. And some kids do. They don't mind having it in the classroom. They like to show off their favorite, you know, bottle that they added all their tears to or whatever. Talk, talk about that. Um, I think it's an important um, aspect in terms of the social anxieties that our kids experience and you know some kids think it's cool to have the cool water bottle and <clears throat> some kids don't want anybody to know that they're drinking the formula um, so that's a discussion to have and then that out that discussion you should have with the teachers and principals some schools um, as a general rule don't allow water bottles on students desk but they might allow it at the back of the room and they have a predetermined time that they go and get their formula. Then expectations for formula drinking. Um, does your kiddo need prompting help to ensure that they're drinking it all, et cetera. Uh, next slide. Well, that might be it. Oh, there we go. <coughs> This was just a, um, a table that we had in our back to school a year ago with some, with some ideas um, for, for items that 
um, can be <clears throat> provided by the schools. Um, it can be a little bit tricky, and I'm, I'm sure Lynn will talk to this a bit as well, but it can be a little bit tricky to to even the schools that they want to buy specialty foods or extra foods. Um, so this uh, power provided by the schools, the, the stuff you can you can kind of bank that, that the schools already hit or or get it. And then on the right side, the things that will all basically always be provided by by the family. So. I think that's all I had. I don't think I have another slide. Great, thanks, Jen. And and Jen was pretending she was choking on her water, but really, she, she's so passionate about this that I think she was getting choked up. And it shows in her work every day and in that presentation. So we're, glad, we're lucky to have her. I was I was going to ask her if she'd had her COVID checked, but. <laughs> all right um our next well, that's that's a painful test <laughs> our next speaker is pamela kowalczyk pam is mom to a six-year-old with pku and she's also an adult with pku herself so she's she's playing for both teams here in the in the seminar tonight as well as she's a special education teacher in the chicago suburbs She's passionate about advocating for others, whether it's those with PKU, other inborn errors of metabolism, or those in the school setting. And she is going to talk about uh, 504s and IEPs. Take it away, Pam. Hi, everyone. Um, let me just share my screen here. Give me one second, bear with me. From the beginning. And it is slow. There we go. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, I'm going to talk about the differences between 504s, IEPs, and just some accommodations and modifications um, that you may see in one of those documents. Um, I work with all different levels of special needs. I have actually had a student with PKU before too, um, but one that wasn't treated. Um, my daughter in that picture right there, she does have PKU, but she was left untreated for over three years. Um, so we work a lot with some of her needs as well. So differences between 504 and IEPs, I know this might be a little bit difficult to read. Um, both of them actually are mandated um, by law. So when this document is written, the school has to follow it follow it legally. Um, parents are a part of the team in both documents. So you are part of, or like in my case, I am part of Team Kelsey um, and all of her teachers and the school nurse, um, the uh, related service providers are also part of Team Kelsey. Um, everyone should be highly involved in both plans and they are both looked at every year. They're reviewed um, or they're reassessed every three years. That would be um, a triangle. For a student to qualify for an IEP, there's actually, I believe, 13 different disability qualifications. Um, and you would have to meet certain criteria. For an IEP, students should be um, performing about two grade levels below um, their typical developing peers. Um, and then they can qualify usually for individuals with um, inborn errors of metabolism. That's going to be the main reason of what is causing some delays in school. Um, and they would qualify under OHI, which stands for Other Health Impairment. Uh, some other OHI qualifications that might be ADD, ADHD. Um, there's also, you can qualify for autism, vision impairment, hearing impairment. Um, specific learning disability. There's, there's a long list of different um, disabilities that you can qualify for. Um, while you're qualifying for an IEP, there um, are just a bunch of tests and evaluations that need to 
um, would be done just to determine where these students actually are. So um, they will have uh, cognitive testing, usually by the school psychologists. There's academic testing on uh, an occupational therapist may feel like they need to look into things, a physical therapist if there's uh, physical limitations or delays, speech and language therapists. Um, and then from those tests, if they deem necessary that the child does qualify for an IEP, they would then have written goals. And those goals are specifically academic goals. Um, so that they can kind of bridge that gap from where they are to where they need to be. Um, and each goal is completely individualized for that student of where they are and meeting them at their level. Um, along with that, sometimes you might see a behavior plan. Um, those are for students that struggle with um, more like functioning in the classroom or maybe behavioral uh, challenges. Um, it can go as far as physical um, aggression towards themselves or others. Um, and the document is pretty long and there's usually more than just one teacher, or one uh, related service involved. Um, and again, the, and there's a whole bunch of accommodations that can be met. There's um, a space or an area where we write additional accommodations for testing both uh, in the school or state testing, district testing, um, and then other things that the students need in order to be successful in the schools, in their school setting. And it's not really to give them a, like a step up to really, um, to coddle them or baby them, but it's really to level that playing field for them. For 504, that's for individuals, um, you'll see more with, um, who have challenges with their health, or maybe they have um, ADD, ADHD that is impacting them in the classrooms, but not to the point where it's um, impacting their academics, where they would need a goal to monitor um, how well they're performing academically. Uh, 504, you see, uh, we see a lot of students with asthma or severe allergies, um, PKU, or um, students that are on special diets, um, have special um, medical needs. Um, another one is um, maybe students who need um, insulin. Um, and really what that 504 plan is, it's usually spearheaded by the school psychologist or social worker, sometimes they have um, a case manager. Um, but that's really just having accommodations or a plan in place for these students, either in the classroom, maybe they still need some um, extended time to take tests, or maybe that ability to, um, for a student that has higher anxiety, leave the classroom to talk to a social worker at any given time. Um, a 504 does not have goals for the academic setting. Um, it's really just to put some things in place, some accommodations. So again, it levels that playing field. Um, and just to make the students feel a little bit more safer or um, like they're trusting that school environment so that they are successful. Um, in an IEP or 504, you're gonna hear modifications and accommodations. A modification is what we're actually changing. So we're changing um, a, the classroom environment or we're changing um, maybe uh, the curriculum that the students are using. So you might see that more in a self-contained setting um, where the whole uh, the classrooms literally change to meet the diverse needs of our students in a smaller setting. Accommodation is what we can provide for the students. Um, again, to level that playing field, but it's not actually altering the, um, the curriculum. It's not um, teaching them two or three grade levels below. It's not putting them in a completely smaller setting for the whole school day. So that would look like maybe um, for a student with vision impairment, larger print or braille. For a student who has a difficult time um, just with executive functioning skills. So having um, lists or 
check um, like checklists and visual schedules or maybe um, a timer by their desk to show um, the start and finish. Um, some frequently used accommodations that you'd see using acronyms, SLD is specific learning, disability, OHI is other health impairment, and executive functioning, which is um, pretty typical of um, children and adults that have PKU and inborn areas of metabolism. Um, different strategies is just having extended time to complete tasks or activities, definitely extended time for tests. Um, having some small group setting um, or smaller group setting instead of being taught consistently in a larger group. So being able to be pulled out and reteach or pre-teach um, an activity. Uh, repeated directions and then transition times are very difficult for all students. So I'm making those transition times a little bit more structured. Uh, for managing time, this is huge. Um, and I'm finding it not just for my students who have um, documented disabilities, but just students in general. Um, there is no concept of time. You have your phones handy. Everything happens in a snap. Like there's no wait time. They have no idea or concept of in five minutes, we're going to, what's five minutes mean to a lot of our students. So um, having those visual schedules or their stopwatches, um, something that we've used is different terminology or what does your five minute plan look like um chunking directions together breaking down assignments too just to help them with time management um, and also managing their space and materials helping them have an idea of what an organized desk looks like so something that we've done is taking pictures of what their desk needs to look like instead of verbally prompting you can take the picture put it on their desk they've got their visual this is what my desk needs to look like to work just organize their space um, color coding and many times we've had um, teachers or related staff members come in and just do check-ins and how maybe even once a week go through their desk what do you need what do you need to throw away and really a lot of that modeling and coaching um, for managing work um, having assignment notebooks a lot of this too is making sure that um, the parents are keeping <laughs> on top of their students too um, what's happening at home having a designated place of where their work is going to be where they need to turn it in how um what that looks like at home and that it's put in their folders and their backpacks to come home and sometimes we see that loss between home and school on the bus but um there's other strategies that we can use for that um again color-coded folders so take out your green folder your green folder is always for science um and then just having their dates and times written on top of their assignments no, I'm talking pretty fast. Um, but wait, there's more than just what I do. So in an IEP or 504, I kind of have listed off other related services. So my job right now, um, I am a, a behavior specialist. And I'm also a case manager for several students. So someone like me will be working with both 504 plans and IEPs and I'm going to be your go-to person. So I'm the one that's uh, managing their minutes and I'm the one that's making sure their minutes are met. I'm the one staying on top of um, the rest of our related services to make sure their minutes are being met and their goals are being met. Um, we are that kind of communication piece between um, all the service providers and the classroom teacher. Um, so we're either special services teacher, we're resource teachers, we're case managers, um, we all have different types of names, but that's pretty much your go-to person when it comes to getting the accommodations um, that your child will need in school. Um, a school psychologist is the one um, they can, depending on the district and the school, um, I've had school psychs actually have IEP goals and minutes that they would meet with their students to work on. And I've had also school psychs that really their main job is to do cognitive testing. And they're the ones that start the initial um, evaluations. A social worker is another individual that would work with your student if they, um, or your child, 
if they need um, additional supports with um, functioning, functioning in the classroom, or maybe peer relationships. Um, maybe there's some struggling at home on a metabolic standpoint, you know, checking in and meeting with them to make sure that you know, how they're feeling about drinking their formula or what that, you know, why, you know, why are you choosing to, I mean, something I did, we would um, dump our formula down the drain to try to hide it. It smells bad. So we always got caught <laughs> as kids. But um, just trying to problems of that with a um, student or your child. A speech pathologist is someone that would work with your um, child if they had any type of language delay. So either they actually cannot um, enunciate or pronounce certain words, um, maybe just in general communication. Um, they may need help with just even word recall. So, uh, or comprehending, asking first then, or even um, who, what, where, when questions. So WH questions. And then there's an occupational therapist, and that's um, a related service that would work on sensory needs. So um, my daughter, who was never treated, has some significant sensory needs um, because of not, or not having a diet or um, any type of access to therapy. So she has um, an OT that works on um, just sensory needs, regulation, dysregulation, uh, they can also work on fine motor skills and gross motor skills uh, when students or, or children are being impacted with, um, you know, just as walking and falling around. Um, a lot of our students that have those sensory needs may trail a wall. Um, and the last one that I didn't get on there is a PT, obviously a physical therapist that would work with more of those movements as well and getting that muscle strength for a low tone or maybe dystonia. And what about the diet? I talk so much about academics. Diet is huge. Um, the school nurse should be involved. It needs to be involved. Um, our school nurse has been great. Um, you should set up a meeting before school even starts because our kiddos go to school and they're eating when they get to school. So not only does the school nurse need to be involved, but even the team that's working with your child. Um, make sure to discuss tips and tricks about how your um, child drinks their formula. Um, I know this was discussed before, but um, like maybe they don't want to drink it in the classroom. My daughter goes into a sensory room and now for some reason the only way she's going to drink formula is if she's doing crunches or sit-ups. So um, <laughs> it's being communicated to the teachers if we ever get back to school. Um, talking about, I know we talked about having a snack then, but making sure you can send either extra formula or having those snacks readily available. Um, these are all things that you need to think about before sending your kid to school and have that ready and presented to the school because um, they don't know. Um, and each PKU child is different. So um, what, where our tolerances are, where our formula recipes are, um, Kelsey has a feed tolerance of 425. I'm only at 150. So how she eats and how I eat is completely different. Um, so even if a, maybe a school had another PKU um, child, it's going to be a little bit different. To the right, I have an example of Kelsey's um, IHP, which is Individualized Health Plan. Um, there's some more information on top, but this is what the nurse and I went over. And this goes over again every year, make sure it's still the same. Um, for her, her formula is kept in the nurse's office and it's refrigerated. Um, Growing up as a child, for myself, my formula was always at the school nurse and it was refrigerated and I would actually drink it at the nurse's office. Whereas for Kelsey, hers is taken out and brought to the classroom and she has an aide that sits with her um, to help her drink her milk. For food, um, I always send food with her. I always make her lunches. That's how I grew up and that's how um, she's growing up. It's just easier for me that way. Um, every milligram is counted for me, so every milligram for her is also counted, and I'm kind of, I get really scared about those, so 
Um, whatever food is sent with her, if she doesn't eat it, it has to be sent back. I ask for wrappers, I ask for food containers, everything gets sent back. And for her, her she will actually eat it for me when we get back um, to the house. Um, if she doesn't, then I just reweigh it and remeasure it and we put it in. Um, big picture is really just communicating. So you have knowing your child, um, you're your child's best advocate, and you're gonna see, you're also gonna see a different child than what the school sees. So um, making sure you're communicating them with that too. If you feel like your child is really really falling behind and you're seeing some struggles at home, and talk to the teachers first. And you know this, you can request testing. You can request to have an evaluation. And if a parent requests, um, or we have to show that there is some type of documentation, and if an um, RTI is uh, responsible to intervention, just the steps we're taking to help that student or your child um, continue to continue to progress in school. Um, but communication is huge, and um, teachers are re we're really on your side, so we are a part of that team, and we really want what's best um, for your student. Um, and sometimes, I mean, there's a lot of red tape in education. Sometimes we're trying to cut some red tape in. We're not able to say a lot um, to parents. So, um, but we will definitely try to fight for your child. But if we're not communicated to, if we're not hearing what's going on or your concerns, then we can't do that either. And then I put any questions, but I think that's all in the Q and A, and we can address that later. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Pam. Um, our next presenter is Lynn. Um, Originally inspired, uh, sorry, originally inspired to feed her two children who have PKU, Lynn's passion for feeding others keeps her at the forefront of food science and processing technology. A recognized leader in the PKU community, Lynn continues to focus, re, sorry, refining existing product formulations while working with Cam, the Cambrook team to develop new and innovative product ideas. Among her roles, she serves as a support group liaison that, support, that provides support and patient advocacy while building strong metabolic community ties to both the families and the clinicians that serve them throughout the U.S. and abroad. Her efforts on the national and international level keep her connected to leading researchers and healthcare providers in the rare disease space. Thank you, Lynn. Um, thank you. Thank you, Danae. Thank you, Sarah. Um, to Dr. Harry Carding, just to let you know I've been COVID tested and I'm good. <laughs> so uh, the school lunch program, or more appropriately named today, the school nutrition program was developed by me for Cameron and Brooke, my two young adult children now, who are PKU. And it had been in use for, uh, for them from grade K through 12 and all through college. Uh, Cambrook's program is now 18 years old and has been made available in over 365 school systems throughout the U.S. I've learned what worked and what didn't work for their nutritional needs, and I've adapted this presentation to hopefully address the concerns and needs of your child. Um, next slide. So the U.S. Department of Agriculture School Meal Programs provides all children in federally funded schools, regardless of background, with the nutritious meals and snacks they need to be healthy. Consistent with federal law, this includes ensuring children with disabilities have equal opportunity to participate in and benefit from the National uh, School Lunch Program, the School Breakfast Program, the Special Milk Program, and the Before and After School Snack Program. Um, these school districts get cash subsidies from the USDA for each and every single meal they serve. In return, schools must serve lunches that meet federal requirements. Next slide. 
So do I need an IEP or 504 plan in place to receive accommodations for the school meal plan? I will explain. So an IEP or individual education plan is exactly that. It's an educational plan and it's not required for a dietary accommodation. A 504 plan is a written management plan outlining how the school will address the individual needs of your child. Um, and it too is not required for a nutritional plan, but it can be implemented depending on preferential requirements by the family. Both IEP and 504 plans can be instituted in the school meal program as a source of additional school funding if the school's budget is constrained. Um, and for the record, both Cameron and Brooke did not have an IEP or 504 plan in place for their dietary accommodations when they were still in school. Uh, next slide. So who is covered by this federal law? Um, under Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 and the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990, Congress ensures that children with disabilities have the same opportunities as children in the general school population to receive education benefits, which includes nutritionally balanced school meals. So metabolic diet, uh, so metabolic disorders such as PKU, HCU, tyrosinemia, MSUD, urea cycle disorders, organic acidemias, and so forth. They're all disabilities that are fully supported under these legislation acts. So the National School Lunch and Nutrition Programs makes it clear that substitutions to the regular meal must be made for children who are unable to, um, uh, to eat the school meals because of their disabilities and at the same cost as the standard um, meal plan. In order to make these food substitutions available for your children, the school must have on file a written statement which is signed by either a licensed physician, physician's assistant, registered dietitian, or a nurse practitioner indicating what the child's disability is, what foods must be omitted from the child's diet, and what foods must be substituted. Simply put, if um, a state gets federal funding, their public schools must accommodate special diets for covered disabilities. Next slide. So who do you approach and in what order uh, when asking for these accommodations? So I recommend reaching out first to um, the school principal. You can reach out to this, um, the food services director in your school definitely the school nurse. And lastly, um, you can approach the USDA Department of Education School Nutrition Program if the school is struggling to meet your child's needs or wishes to learn more about how best to implement the meal program. Um, and remember, I gotta tell you, please remember that building um, a good and friendly relationship between you and the accommodating um, team is so key. Um, you don't want your child to be embarrassed or stigmatized. Next slide. So the Campbell School Lunch Program, which can include dozens of meal options that mimic the school's regular meal uh, calendar, consists of three components that help you understand your responsibilities, the school's responsibilities, and helpful hints for your child's success. Uh, next slide, please. So um, our, our food services guide, this is Cambook's food service guide, is a turnkey solution for the food service professional. Included in the guide is all the information that I'm covering for you today, um, including the USDA uh, food and nutrition services website links, the full set of documents for accommodating your child with special dietary needs, which are easy forms, um, for you and your clinician to fill out. There's a menu calendar, which includes 20 complete low protein lunch meals. There's a shopping list, which identifies just the necessary low protein foods your kitchen staff will need on hand to make those 20 meals. There are meal recipes, which are super easy to prepare and assimilate 
your child with their peers. Both hot and cold lunch items are represented. A uh, complete nutritional fact panel and amino acid profile are also provided. There's an institutional price list and order form that are used by institutions and schools who wish to purchase our products on credit. And lastly, um, please know that, that Cambrook's guide, Cambrook's food um, menu plan is a guide. It can be used in its entirety because we have an entire plan or it can be merely used as a model to showcase what worked for Cameron and Burke. Next slide, please. So this is really interesting because every child has the right to a nutritionally balanced meal, which includes the protein. As an option, a legislative provision for students with disabilities adds requirements for the substitution of non-dairy beverage for fluid milk for children with medical or special dietary needs in the lunch and breakfast, uh, only in the lunch and breakfast programs. This rule establishes nutrient standards for non-dairy beverage alternatives to fluid milk. It allows schools to accept a written substitution request from that licensed uh, clinician and a parent for the access, um, acceptable non-dairy beverage and make school food authorities responsible for substitution expenses that exceed the federal reimbursement. So this rule um, assures that students who consume non-dairy beverage alternatives to uh, receive, receives, excuse me, um, important nutrients found in normal fluid milk. It's kind of a mouthful, sorry. <laughs> but I really, I, I assert this um, only because uh, this too is a legislative provision. And for those children that don't have insurance reimbursement, especially during today's unprecedented times, this is an enforceable right or privilege that you can exercise as an additional financial safety net. And um, just as an FYI, I reached out to numerous USDA state agencies around the country over the last, oh, maybe eight years or so to make sure that what I am speaking to you today, the language that I'm speaking um, with regard to the law and, and what I'm presenting to you, these agencies are full on board and an important resource for assistance when schools try to deny your children's accommodations. Next slide, please. State agencies are responsible for the administration of the National School Nutrition Program, and they are the link between the Food and Nutrition, uh, Nutrition Service and local school program operators. They can be found by clicking on the USDA link above, which you can see on the top right hand um, side of your screen. And why would you need to do this? So if the family is met by the school system with resistance and the school argues that they will not accommodate your child, which has been the case in so many times, um, it's up to you to take action and it's very simple. I recommend first a subtle reminder that the program is required by law and if necessary, you can refer the nutrition operators in your school to the USDA Office for Food and Nutrition Programs. Your school is well aware of this resource. The USDA Office for Food and Nutrition Programs job is to ensure that the programs such as this are managed according to federal law. These state agencies will facilitate communication between the program operators, meaning the school, and the USDA Food Nutrition Service, guaranteeing the success of the school nutrition program for your child. But if that subtle reminder fails, I ask you again to click on the Food Nutrition Program link above. Next slide. And when you click on that link, it takes you to this landing page in the left frame. Select your state from the drop down on the left side and select National School Lunch Program from the drop down on the right side of that first frame. And in this case, I've used Massachusetts as an example. And here's what the landing page looks like from there in the right frame for Massachusetts. And that provides the department name, which is the Massachusetts, in our case, uh, in Massachusetts, the Massachusetts Department of Elementary um, and Secondary Education. 
it provides the address, the administrator's phone number, and clickable links for website and email addresses and additional inf information. And then to the right side, you see, uh, you see various programs, including the National School Lunch Program, School Breakfast Program, Special Milk Program, and Summer, uh, summer Food Service Program. When you call, if and when you call, ask for the program that you're inquiring about by name. Next slide. And because um, people can feel very intimidated on how to communicate with the USDA when the school denies the meal accommodation, I just wanna offer this advice to you. It's so easy. You simply pick up the phone, you call, you introduce yourself, you let them know the specific school name and the town that your child belongs to and that he or she is being denied the meal accommodations for their, their disability in school. So long as the school has an advance of this call, that written statement, remember that I mentioned earlier, um, by the clinician indicating what the child's disability is, the explanation of why the disability restricts the child's diet and so forth, the foods to be emitted from the child's diet, the foods that must be substituted, as long as you have all of that information in advance in a written statement by your clinician, the USDA will step in from there. All you have to do is tell them the name of the school, give them the information you're being denied, and when, all, when that is said, the USDA will step in from there, they will intervene and remind the school of their legal obligation and they will do what's necessary to enforce the law. You, uh, the school and the USDA all play a role in the success of your child and it is your child's civil right to receive these accommodations. Next frame. So um, this overview was presented to increase your understanding of your child's civil rights. They do exist in the school's responsibilities to uphold your child's special dietary needs of school. This guide is not intended to address specific needs that may be unique to your child. But from there, I just wanna thank you very much for allowing me to share the information with you about this important program. I'm really passionate about this. I've been doing this for a long time and, um, and, and it is your child's civil right. And I will lastly say, and it's not written here, but Danae can share, uh, Danae and Sarah can share this information, but I always give my, my name, my email address. You can always email me personally, and I will get involved with you and your school system, and I will make sure that that school system upholds their end of their deal, what is important for your child. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Um, last but certainly not least is a woman who doesn't really need an introduction. Uh, Brenda Winiarski founded cookforlove.org to provide recipes to people who need to cook for themselves or for a family member on a low protein diet. Originally a speech language pathologist, Brenda worked in early intervention and specialized in feeding issues. When her first child was diagnosed with PKU, Brenda became passionate a nice way of saying obsessed, about developing delicious meals her daughter would enjoy. She eventually enrolled in the chef training program at the National Gourmet Institute for Health and Culinary Arts in New York City, one of the only vegetarian-based culinary schools in the United States. Over the years, Brenda's catalog of low-protein recipes has grown, but it was always her dream to create a space where everyone could share their own recipes that they cook for love. Her free website, Cook for Love, is the manifestation of that dream. You're up. Hey everyone. Um, I guess we'll just start on the slides. Um, but the first thing I want to say is, first of all, what an incredible panel and uh, just such great information from everyone. And I kind of want to relate um, some of the things from a personal level um, in, in terms of other things that have been touched upon. Uh, number one, I know that Pamela was talking a lot about the IEP and the 504. Um, my 
daughter doesn't have um, any uh, learning issues where she required um, special accommodations. But because of her metabolic disorder, we did put a 504 in place. And the sole reason for that was um, if her levels were elevated, we did not want her, if there was a test that was scheduled for that day, um, if she had a documented high fee level, we did not want her tested. We wanted to give her time, give us time to get her levels knocked back down. Um, so that's an example of just using a 504 so specifically for whatever it is that it, you're looking for. Um, and I always met with uh, Molly's teachers at the beginning of the school year and kind of developed my own um, guide. I looked at all the different ones that were out there and said, what is it that I'm looking for from, from the school? And one of my first asks were always uh, three days notice um, before any uh, birthdays or food activities. So I would be able to figure out what it was I wanted to do to uh, accommodate Molly um, and, and make it so that she could fit in um, with whatever was happening. So, um, you know, it, when Molly was younger um, and was more open about, about sharing um, things that she was going through, I just made an announcement on the first day back to school um, and just said, hey, you know, if, if I'm calling you before your kid's birthday, I'm not a crazy stalker. Um, <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out what you're going to be sending in and I just want to make my daughter feel like, you know, she's, she's able to be a part of it as best as she can. So that was that was always my first ask. Um, and it really just depended on teachers. Um, you know, I had some teachers who were so wonderful um, and I didn't need a 504 until I encountered that one teacher who who wasn't so wonderful and who didn't really understand why it was a big deal. And after that, it was sort of pulling in the, build, the big guns. And remember that you are your child's advocate um, and you do what you need to do um, to, to make them feel like they are their part of what's going on in school and don't feel isolated. And I think it totally depends on your child's personality, um, what you do and what you don't do and, and how far you take it. Um, my daughter, it was very important for her to, to fly under the radar, to, for people not to know um, what she was going through. So I always tried my hardest um, to, to accommodate and to make things look as similar as possible. But anyway, let me start with the presentation that I actually did as opposed to free thinking this because I've had a lot of wine. Um, let's go with the first slide, please. <laughs> Let's make it for left. Okay. In terms of um, lunch, let's just start with thinking about what did you eat when you were a kid? You probably had like the variety of, of two different things that you had every single day. I swear to you, I had a cheese sandwich from, I would say, second grade to probably my senior year of high school. I just had it every day. It was easy for me to make. Don't go crazy. Um, but know that there are ways, even with the dietary restrictions, to, to provide variety if that's what it is you're looking for. Now, some gadgets to make you look fancier um, and to make the variety look, look more exciting is to start off is, you know, up in the top uh, corner here, there's um, different sandwich presses. And, you know, this is one from Pampered Chef from probably about 15, 20 years ago, but there are other things on Amazon as well. And what I love about it is it seals the sandwich. So if I make a loaf of bread, I can do, you know, a couple of Biscoff and jellies and throw them in the freezer and they're nice and sealed. Um, I do not waste the crust. The crusts go and make breadcrumbs. There's no waste in my house with food. It's too much work. Um, and they're in the freezer and I can pull them out on a day when I'm pressed for time. Um, you'll also see down there are some various um, cookie cutters. Uh, these just make sandwiches look cute and they're just fun. They're more fun to eat. And those bento boxes are the cutest things that have ever been invented. And they are perfect for any sort of metabolic disorder or any dietary restrictions because you've got your fruit in one, you've got your vegetable in another. That's two compartments already filled for you. Then you get your special snack and then you have whatever it is your entree is. And it's fun and it's interesting. And when it's shaped like a heart or it's shaped like a flower or it's shaped like a star, it just is smaller and more manageable to eat um, and it's just more fun and the other kids are jealous and that's what you want. You want the other kids wanting what it is your kid has versus them saying, ew, what are you eating? Because that's the way kids are. Okay, so those are my favorite, favorite gadgets. Next slide. Let's just talk about some simple cold sandwich ideas. Okay, peanut butter and jelly is what everybody has. Every kid. 
do Biscoff and jelly or do no nut butter um, if your tolerance is higher. It's delicious. It's, it's, Biscoff to me is the most delicious thing in the world. It's a little sweet. Um, no nut butter is a little bit higher in protein if you're looking to sort of boost the, the protein content. Um, and it's not sweet. It's a neutral flavor. Um, you can do Biscoff and thinly sliced apples. You can do a fluffer buffer, which is Biscoff and fluff. It's delicious. It's, I'm not saying it's good for you but it's really, really good and the kids will be happy. Um, Morningstar breakfast strips are amazing. They are a little bit higher in fee, so use half if you need to. You do a BLT with that. You do add avocado. You make it a triple decker if you want to. You can add, you can do um, a fried green tomato and put that on it and make it, if your kid is older, and make it a sandwich that everybody is going to want. Alouette is fairly low in protein and it is probably the most delicious cheese spread ever made. And you can do that with cucumber and you can be a fancy little British person. It's delicious. Um, you can do Trader Joe's eggplant dip. It is, or you can make your own baba ganoush, but you can take shortcuts. And I swear to you people, I know you look at my recipes and you think I never take a shortcut. You can take shortcuts. So you do a little bit of eggplant dip. You do some chopped olives in there, some shredded carrots. It's fantastic. It's a really nice sandwich. You can do your favorite low protein cheese with lettuce, tomato, onion. Those are your cold sandwiches. So already we have, added one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's a whole bunch there, okay? That's just cold sandwiches. Next slide. Oh my God. If you do not have a sandwich press, you must invest in one. It all of a sudden makes things super fun. First of all, okay, let me talk real. Home goods, $9.99, probably. And it looks like a little purse. Anyway, you open it up, you put your bread in there, because let's be honest, once the bread gets frozen, it doesn't taste the same unless you toast it or you do something fun with it. I know your kids are like mine, and if it's not fresh, they don't want it. Okay, well, let's toast it. Let's brush it with garlic butter, and let's put some mozzarella in there, and let's add a little bit of marinara sauce, a little bit of basil, you got in the pizza pocket, just like that. You can do a gourmet grilled cheese. You could do your smoked Gouda. You could do caramelized onions. You could also do some sauteed greens in there. I want to be clear. I don't get up at four o'clock in the morning to make Molly her lunch. I take whatever's left over and I make it into a sandwich. I'm not as crazy as you guys think I am. I swear to you, I'm not. I am crazy, but I'm not as crazy as you think I am. All right. You can do, again, you can do just a plain grilled cheese and you do a little thing of ketchup with it. And all of a sudden it's exciting because you have a little ketchup package. It's cool. You'll be happy. Your friends are going to want it. And that's the key. Next slide, please. Okay, other things that we can do. There's a whole demonstration on this. We can provide the link. We did a whole thing on um, doing lunches. Pinwheels are, are key. They are the easiest thing you can do because you can do it the night before. You can fill it with whatever your leftovers are, chopped up fine, and there's some examples here. But you can go with, what did I have for dinner? Can I chop it up? What can I throw with it that goes with it? Let me roll it up in a wrap. Let me wrap it up in some plastic. Let me throw it in the fridge and in the morning, I'm just going to slice it. And then it's a fun little pinwheel. Um, you can do wraps. And what you need to think about is the sandwiches that you like that are higher protein, how can you adapt them to make them lower protein? So there's 8 million, you go into any deli, 8 million sandwiches that have fried chicken on it. Look at their combinations. What can I do instead of fried chicken? You can do fried cauliflower. If you do the KFC recipe that's on Cook for Love, you bread and fry that bad boy. You put it in the freezer, and then you just take it out and reheat it so that it's, it's room temperature by the time your kids have it. You can do fried cauliflower with some Morningstar breakfast strip. You can add some ranch dressing to it. You can do fried cauliflower with some barbecue sauce. Um, you can do a fried pickle. Oh my God, it makes the most amazing sandwich in the world. We already talked about fried green tomatoes. You have to just start thinking, what can add bulk to this to make it exciting and make the other kids want it? Next slide, please. Okay, Lunchables. They're gross. We know that. But we know all the kids have them and our kids want them. They're actually fairly simple to replicate. You just think about the things that are out there. You take a low protein piece of bread, you brush this with some garlic butter, you fry it on a pan for a second so it's lightly toasted. You put it in their little bento box. You have a cute little container. Hang on. It has the marinara sauce, or you use Cambrick's little marinara sauce things. And 
then you have some low protein cheese and they can make their own little pizza. That's what Lunchables are. It's not melted cheese. It's the same thing. And it's the same concept of making it fun and you have a fun snack with it. And there's a million snacks out there that you don't have to make that can really balance it. You can do quesadillas, cut again into the fun shapes. And then you have those little individual guacamoles and those little individual salsas. It's fun then. You can do, if you wanna go crazy, next time you're making KFC, cut some cauliflower into medallions and have those in your freezer. Fry them up, have them in your freezer, throw them in your air fryer in the morning. You could do little biscuits and you could do the little fried cauliflower with some coleslaw if you happen to have it from the deli. You can do some barbecue sauce, you can do some cheese and they can make their own little sandwiches and all of a sudden it's fun. If your kid loves breakfast, why can't you send them little pancakes with a little dipping the sauce of, um, of maple syrup? It's a way to get the calories in. It's a way to make it fun. You have to think outside of the box. You can do mini scones. You can do mini muffins. You can do that, serve that with the thing of coconut yogurt. You're serving a well-rounded meal. You're getting the calories in, you're getting the low fee in, and you're balancing it out. You can do soup. You can do uh, mini pockets. Any kind of leftover dough you have, keep it in the fridge for a couple of days, roll it out. Whatever you have of leftovers from the night before, fold it over and fry it up, and it will be a really, really nice lunch. Um, you can do pasta, you can keep it warm in a thermos, or you can do a cold pasta salad. The other thing that I'm gonna tell you is give your child as much freedom as you can. Teach them the diet, teach them that it's balanced, do things like diet boards, there's a whole bunch of them on Cook for Love's Facebook page to give you ideas of what to do, so that they learn what to do and enable them to make choices. It killed me that my daughter wanted a hundred calorie pack of some sort of a cookie that was like 60 milligrams of feed when I knew I could make her something that would taste so much better that would be five milligrams of feed. But you know what? If it meant that much to her and I could find a way to balance it, we could have pasta for dinner. We can make it work. We had the rule of, you know, if you went into school and you decided that you wanted the French fries that they were serving at the, the hot lunch, you had to text me by a certain hour and if you texted me by that time, then you know what? I could accommodate dinner. If you didn't, then you had to make pasta for dinner. Otherwise, I could, I could flex dinner and say, this is what we're going to do instead. You have to teach your child from the earliest of ages to just, first of all, communicate with you and be honest with you. There was never, ever a time where my daughter got in trouble for making for, for eating something that she shouldn't have eaten because often it was the best choice that was out there and we could flex it and we could accommodate it in, in some sort of way. And I think empowering your kids is probably one of the most important things. Next slide, please. Okay, these are just pictures of some favorite um, snacks you can have in your in your various things in your lunchbox. Um, we are big fans of sugar wafers. Um, they're great plain. Um, they're absolutely amazing dipped in chocolate because you know what they become? Kit Kats. Um, you take your, your pretzel crisps and you serve them with the Trader Joe's um, eggplant dip. It's fantastic. There's a whole bunch of grain-free because it's the new thing, the, you know, the paleo diet. There's lots of cassava options out there, out there which are naturally lower in fee. Absolutely gluten-free crackers are fantastic. But please don't forget your fruits and vegetables. They are key to the diet. They, they are what's going to fill up your kid. They're going to give them fiber. They're, they're healthy options. Always make sure that in your lunchbox there are fruits or vegetables or both. Um, next slide. Okay, food in the classroom. I am so sorry if you are in grammar school and every other week they're having a party. It is torture. Um, it is really, I've done a lot um, to, to, to try to make the low protein diet um, better and to try to make my daughter's life, because um, food is everywhere, to just try to make her feel part of it. The only thing that I feel like was a sacrifice for me was volunteering to be class parent. Um, it was torture. It was torture. But as a class parent, I knew when there was going to be a party. And guess what? I had the sign-up sheet. So who do you think hogged the, the snack that was being sent in? Me. This one. This one. All those kids ate low-protein food and had no idea because I made it look pretty and it always tasted good. So if they had, you know, at Halloween, they had the skull cookies where the raspberry, you know, was like the blood bleeding out of the skull's eyes. 
all they talked about was how cool it looked and how fun it was and how good it tasted. They didn't know that it was made for a special diet. So it was the same, everybody was eating the same thing. And as the class parent, I was the one who was able to call people and be like, hey, are you sending in food for your kid's birthday? What is it you're thinking of sending in? And then I would try to match it for my daughter. Now, a lot of times it worked, but there's always going to be those times when it doesn't. And having that policy of three days notice is something to be able to hold the school accountable for. Um, and it was, it was the, you know, an agreement with the principal, it was an agreement with the teachers. And there are gonna be parents who, who honestly, it's life. You, you forgot, you didn't send in anything, or you, didn't, you forgot to notify, you didn't know what you were gonna send in until you went to the supermarket and you saw what was there. So in the, in the teacher's freezer, uh, in, the, in the teacher's uh, conference room, there was always a cupcake that was frozen. And the teacher always had icing and she had chocolate and vanilla. Um, so she could just ice whatever it was. Um, and if she knew something came in in the morning, she knew to take that out. There were also uh, uh, cookies in there in case there was some sort of a, a cookie thing. Um, and then there was a box with some favorite treats. Um, and it just made that there was less opportunity for my daughter to find out. It was still going to happen because that's real life and those were learning experiences for her and she would come home and I, and I urge all parents that when your kid comes home and is upset to not tell them about, you know, it, you know, it could be worse because this could happen or this could happen. I want you to think about how you felt when your child was diagnosed and you were first dealing with it. It was devastating to you. And if someone didn't validate those feelings, if someone said, well, you know, it could be worse, they could have this, it created visceral reaction in you. This is your child learning that. Um, and your child kind of going through their own acceptance of what it is. So when they come home and they, they're upset because they had, someone had a cookie and they, they couldn't have it and the whole class had it, sit down with them and just be like, God, that, that had to be terrible. And let them be sad. And then when they're done being sad, say, what can we do to make it better? Do you want to make cookies? Or do you just want to have a sad day? I think talking about it and being real about it with your kids is one of the most important things. And I wish, looking back, my daughter's now in college, I wish I allow, had allowed her to be sad for as long as she wanted to be sad. But as a parent, I wanted to fix it. I wanted to just make her happy. So it was, oh, that happened, let's make cookies, let's do this. Let them also just feel what they need to feel and validate those feelings so that they can come to an acceptance and they can figure out the best way to make it work for them. And the way that it works for them is not the way you want it to work. I, I promise you that, that that's never gonna happen. Um, but they're the ones who are living with it. As a parent, you only know what it's like for the work of it. You don't know what it's like to actually have the disorder and you need to be respectful. Um, and you need to just do what you need to do for your kids. Um, next slide, I think that might even actually be it. Do I have another one or am I done today? Why well, might be done? I think you're done. <laughs> you're done. How fast do I talk? Anyway, if you have any questions, you know you guys can reach out to me um, and, and I'm here for you. Well, I don't actually have an end slide, so I'm gonna stop this, stop the share, and then I'm going to make it so you guys can see all of our faces here. It keeps changing my screen, so bear with me here. Um, so now should be changing to this gallery view, so you should see all of our smiling faces here on the panel. Um, sorry. Um, I want to thank all our panelists for their fantastic presentations. I know that we ran a little bit late, but I really appreciate everyone for hanging in there. Um, we're going to open up the floor now to questions for the panel. Um, and I do have a couple that have been left here um, in the, in the Q&A part. So if you do have questions, you can either do the raise hand feature in, I believe it's in the chat section, or you can type them into the Q&A. If you use the raise hand feature in the chat feature, um, we will unmute you and then you will be able to ask your question. Um, so you'll, you'll need some kind of microphone, obviously. Um, but um, if you put it into the Q&A part, we will just ask the question live and then um, 
the person it's directed to, we can uh, do that. So there is one question hanging out here, and I'm sure it was for Lynn. Um, it says, when you were talking about um, the school lunch program, do you know if it encompasses the child and adult care food program, which some child care centers use? The adult and child care program? Sorry, in, in which kind of facility? Sorry. In uh, the uh, school? Uh, it says child care centers. So um, child and adult care food program, which some child care centers use. Do you know anything about that program? The only thing I can tell you, I'm not exactly familiar with it, but the only thing I can say is that if it is a federally funded program, that would be, that would make the difference. Yes, they would, they would need to uphold uh, the law from that end. Same thing with the summer school programs. As long as uh, these summer school programs are federally funded, then, then that applies just the same. I don't know if I answered the question. I'm sorry if I didn't. Oh, she's saying it's it's on the USDA USDA under the list of programs. So okay, then then it would definitely yes, absolutely it would apply. And if, if you know what, let me tell you something. I am Lynn L Y N N at Cambrook.com. Send me an, uh, a message and I will gladly look into it and give you specific information back on that. I'm going to type her e email address into the chat section for all of you. Okay, um, thank you. Oh. All right, um, we have Abby who has a question. I'm going to un, well, I think I can unmute her. Oh, there we go. Abby, you are, Unmuted. Okay, so I have two things. One, um, I have experience with CACFP, which is the Child and Adult Care Food Program, um, and it is federally funded, but often it's used by privately owned child care centers, and it's not a requirement, to my knowledge, that all students be a part of that. So I'm not sure if every child care center would have to comply with that. That that could be kind of a gray area. Um, I do know that if you are in enrolled in a Head Start program because Head Starts are federally funded, that they do have to supply the accommodations of the different foods for your child. So I think it might kind of depend on the program, but I do know that CACFP is a federally funded through USDA. So I'm not quite sure there. Um, and then my question, I keep, so I know Pam um, answered in the Q&A box, but I keep getting conflicting like, my little guy's starting kindergarten. He has a 504. Or he has an IEP, but I don't know if we also need to implement a 504. I hear yes and I hear no, so I don't know. So usually um, if you have an IEP, that pretty much trumps that 504. And if an IEP is going to be, it's, you're, in like least restrictive environment it's a little bit even more restrictive because there's more services you have goals for academic you have goals for speech you have goals for ot and then within that iep you can also then um and brenda was talking about it say you know talk about that pku and say you want those three-day notices or they need to drink formula this way and then there should be involved in that IEP as well. So PKU is also going to be taken care of in that individualized education plan. Okay, so as of right now, it's like not in there. So we would need to add that part in there since he'll be going to school full day this year. Correct. Okay, thank you so much. All right, um, so another question that came in, um, with my child is in preschool, uh, my, sorry, my child is in a preschool that is separate program from the school. Do they still qualify for the Cambrook program with the school? So that really depends, um, not necessarily. Um, I have found that most programs, um, you know, have, you know, have accommodated uh, just based on benevolence but I, I'm not 100% certain if they're required 
you know, under federal legislation to do so. But again, pass my email out and I can, I can look into that. Just so everyone knows, in the follow-up email that will come out um, either tomorrow or the day after, um, I will include contact information for the panelists who wish to have, share their contact information. Um, there will be links to the things that Lynn had in her presentation um, and any other information that the panelists wish to pass along um, links. And I have a ton of additional resources I'm going to pass along to you all of you as well. Um, so um, hopefully there's plenty of things in there that can be of resource to, to each of you. Um, some of them are specific to certain disorders, um, but usually they have enough that overlap. So, um, any- We had a question from uh, uh, Carolina Melser about uh, developmental pediatrician versus uh, neuropsych evaluation. Um, so I would just say that the developmental pediatrician is going to provide the same coordinating care that a typical pediatrician would with the additional training of uh, having a focus on children that are maybe not following the neurotypical path. So if they need extra specialized referrals or maybe there might be some additional prescribing. So the pediatrician is really still going to fulfill that role of being the central person that's going to coordinate. And the psychologist is still going to follow into a, a specialized position. And so it has to do with which services you're seeking. If you're looking for somebody to manage the care of the child, developmental pediatrician. If there's questions about the impact of learning or memory or attention or language on learning skills or as it relates to the metabolic condition, then that's when you start wondering if a neuropsych evaluation is going to be an important part of answering those questions. So it's not an either or, um, it can easily be a both, it's just a matter of where the services you're looking for. I have a couple of questions that were sent in ahead of time too. Um, Pam, this one's for you. <laughs> uh, so the question was, how do you navigate um, enforcement of an IEP and a 504 with virtual schooling? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> and Pam, can I cut in right before you yeah. uh, answer that and say our poll answers, which I guess I can share the results. 52% uh, of participants' children are going, children are going back in person wow. for now, I will say, as a caveat. 29% uh, are going online, 2% are in hybrid, 10% are in homeschool, um, and then 7% just don't know what the heck is going on. Um, and also we have uh, hundreds of people, 45% are in elementary school, and then a few, uh, the next biggest group is pre-K and daycare, and then moving up to middle school and a few high school students. But just as you answer that, keep in mind um, that at least a third of these parents are, are looking at online enforcement of these IEPs and 504s. Right, okay. So um, I've been in training for the past two weeks and we our students actually don't start until um, Monday. And being able to service our students with IEPs are a huge topic. It's just a hot topic and um, I can speak on behalf of what my district is doing. Uh, my daughter is in a dis different district, so I can see um, just kind of how two different districts in the same state um, are working. So um, I am actually calling and reaching out to all of my parents of students that have IEPs. Um, and I will, we do, there are some goals that are going to have to be amended because we just, we're not going to be able to keep data on some of the goals that um, were written um, to be in school. Um, as far as accommodations such as taking tests, small group setting, um, I know in our district we are going to really be focusing on one-on-one -on -one attention for our students. 
um, our higher need students that need more of that one-on-one -on -one support or need more of like, we call it like an extra dose of reading, writing, um, or math. Um, for us, we are doing Zoom links and our students will be joining us through a Zoom chat. And really it's gonna be the best that we can. Um, a lot of it is gonna be determined on how the students are going to respond and how they're going to act in a virtual setting. Um, in the spring, we, we went virtual in March and most of our students were online and by the end of the school year, we may be had 50%. So if the students aren't showing up, we can't service them. Um, and that's been very difficult and challenging for us. If the case manager isn't reaching out to your students when school starts, if you haven't heard anything from your case manager, I would highly recommend reaching out to them first. Um, there are still a lot of unknowns. So we're waiting for, um, was it today at 2 p.m.? We got something from the state board and they're like, by the way, this is changing. I'm like, that's cool. We just changed that in the IEP. So let's call the parents again. So um, we're doing, you know, we're, everything's changing. Um, just like, I feel like COVID is just changing all the time too. So is the education and what education is going to look like in a virtual world. Um, if you feel like our services aren't being met as far as speech, OT, PT, um, reach out to those service providers. And I would also email or CC the um, case manager as well, um, just so that they're aware. If you still don't hear back from the case manager, um, I would give them, you know, at least 24 hours because we, um, in my personal experience, I'm going to be teaching online. I'm not going to have, because I'm seeing students back to back to back from 8 in the morning till 3.30 in the afternoon. Um, and then after that, I have to teach my own kiddo. Um, so, and I actually teach her. Um, so we, you know, give us 24 hours. Some of us are not going to be able to respond to emails till like midnight or something, um, just because of what's going on. But um, they should. If they don't, that's when I would go to the department chair, or we have, or the principal even should be someone you could reach out to first. Um, but definitely talk to that case manager. Um, I hope that answers some of the questions. Really, that's a really <laughs> difficult question to answer because I think we're all kind of just treading water and we're just hoping for the best. And we just decided that everyone's going virtual and remote. So um, that was a, another huge change and surprise and everyone's caseloads and everything changed too. So, Kim, do you mind if I add on to your answer? Please. So I'd have three recommendations in thinking about IEPs with a virtual learning environment. The first one is to, to keep in mind that the IEP is an individualized education plan. And so I think one of your red flags or kind of guiding stars is whether or not you feel like what you're being presented is tailored for your child or are you being asked to take a one size fits all approach. If you're being asked to take one size fits all approach and it works for your child, then fine. But if it's not working for your child, then that's kind of your red flag of this is time to push to make sure that it is tailored to your child's needs. Mm -hmm. Secondly, when we talk about virtual learning, it's really important to keep in mind if we're talking about synchronous or asynchronous learning and what is gonna fit with your child's needs. So some children are gonna do much better if it's live in the moment and they can see what people are doing. Other children are not gonna be able to do that. And online learning where they have to be live for seven hours is not gonna be feasible. So again, thinking about the virtual learning environment and having it be individual, one thing that you might push for is if they're doing online learning and it's all synchronous, maybe your child's accommodation is access to a recording so that they can be asynchronous. The third thing that I would say is that the schools are still responsible for the education plan as it was written, including all of the different service areas. And 
practically speaking, some of those things might not be able to happen based on your specific school, but the school is still supposed to be responsible for those areas. And so there should be clear on which services are still being provided, which services are not being provided. And if they're not being provided, what are either the criteria or the timetable for their implementation? So an unfortunate truth is many of our children are gonna be able to not get their full IEP plans this year, but it's not a thing that happens as a casual conversation. It's a thing where the school writes out and says, here are the components that we can implement, here are the components that we cannot implement at this point, but here's the date at which we're gonna revisit, or here's the criteria at which we'll revisit it. So again, three things I would recommend. One, make sure that you feel like it's individual to your child, and if it doesn't, that's your red flag. Two, keep in mind that there's multiple types of virtual or remote learning. And so one of the things that you could push for is a different mode of remote or virtual learning. And then the third is anything that's a part of your existing IE plan, P plan that's not being implemented, it should be written out. So you should get some sort of documentation from the school on why it's not being implemented. And again, there's just things that might not be able to happen this year. And if that's the case, it, it's a difficult situation, but it should be written out on why it's not happening. Going off what you're saying, um, that you meant is we, well, and part of me calling my parents is we are doing some amendments. So that's letting the parents know different things that we just can't do. And then how we're going to try, we're trying to think of different goals that we can do in a virtual setting that's gonna be somewhat comparative as best as we can. And if it's not working, that's when we need those parents to talk to us, hey, this isn't working, I need A, B, C, and D. Because if you don't tell us, we're not gonna know. Um, but definitely, definitely, like you were saying, you gotta communicate with those teachers and those case managers, and they should be telling you, like you said, it's a written legal document, they should be saying, um, this goal or this part of the IEP is not going to be able to be met during this virtual learning time, we're going to revisit or we're going to look at it when either criteria or time frame. Thank you, uh, Ben and Pam. Um, I'm going to take one more, well, two more questions here and then um, we'll close this out. Um, so someone posed the question, in your experience, do most children uh, with PKU, and this really goes across the board for any of the low protein uh, disorders here, uh, drink their formula or milk at lunch and snack time only. Would you recommend having your child have access whenever they want their formula? I think Pamela is probably the best person to answer. <laughs> but as a person who has a metabolic disorder, I think both her and both you and Danae would probably be able to offer the most information. I can offer my opinion, but go first. Um, I think it's very individualized. So for me personally, um, like I said, I'm only at 150 milligrams of fee a day. So I'm mostly formula. And when I drink my formula, I don't want to eat. Um, so, and I just spread that throughout the day. That's just how I do it. And for me, even in, uh, growing up, I had access to it pretty much whenever I needed it or wanted it. Um, but I mostly went during snack time anyway, because that's when my friends were doing it. Um, for Kelsey, since she doesn't communicate very well, she has specific times and I have that laid out. She has it for snack. And then if she doesn't want to eat, I'm not going to force the food upon her yet because didn't choose to have it, you know, for me, the formula makes my stomach queasy and upset, or my milk, I call it milk, um, you guys will understand milk, other people sometimes don't, <laughs> um, but she's also a completely different child, she can chug five, six ounces of formula, and then eat 62, 70 grams of pasta right after that, I don't know how, but she does, so, um, She's been really good about that. It's really, really dependent on the kid. I think kind of trying to talk to them and be like, well, how do you feel after that formula? Um, and then also in a school setting, when you're thinking about a child having their milk at the school setting, if you let them have access to it whenever they want, they may 
decide, hey, I'm going to take this test now. I need my formula or I need to go drink my milk because that actually sounds better than taking this huge quizzer test. And it becomes more of an avoidance thing. Um, <laughs> or they may choose something, uh, you know, a time that just is more convenient for them. It's not really that they're going to sit there and drink their milk. They may sit there and just sip it little by little and then just more waste of time than actually drink the milk. So having maybe a set time, time frame for them to drink um, might be even more beneficial so that it's not cutting into more of those core times, um, those core teaching times where they're not missing the, the meat of the lessons. And I would, I would just say from a hunger satiation um, perspective as a, as a prior feeding therapist, you know, having your formula sipping it throughout the day, you're not going to get that stomach expansion and that retraction that you want in order to sort of build that schedule, which sometimes is hard for grazers throughout the day. So um, for, for my daughter, it was um, in um, with, with her lunch and um, we, we chose things like um, restore um, so that that could help supplement and whatever she took, she took. But it was before she went to school, she had a lot of formula. Um, she had some restored for her lunch. Um, and then, because it looked like Gatorade and it looked like what other kids were having. And then when she came home, she had her drink. And then at nighttime, she had her drink. So it was still, still throughout the day. And there was that little bit um, that, you know, if she felt she needed it, she could have it. But, but I do agree with the, with the idea that you can kind of take it and use it to your advantage, which is one of the reasons why we, we eventually established in her 504 when she got older that um, there was no testing, um, you know, if, if fee levels were high after an illness versus poor dietary management and poor choices. So if she made a bad choice um, and, you know, I'm, I'm going to have this, or I'm going to have more French fries and I'm going to come home and I'm going to eat this, um, she kind of had to have the natural consequence of that. And that was a really hard thing as a parent to do. Um, but if it was a documented high fee level because of illness, yes, we will accommodate you. But if it was because of poor choice, Sorry, kiddo. <laughs> that, that, was, that was a bad idea. One thing I, I, I would like to add is I do think having formula at some point during the school day is important. Um, I hear from many families in my, in my position um, that they just don't take their formula during the day. They take it in the morning before school. So that could be six, seven o'clock in the morning. And then their kids coming home at three or four and then finally taking it. And you think about the role that formula is supposed to play, and it's providing your nutrients, your protein, your energy. And when you don't have that, your brain is not able to function at full capacity. Um, and so you're, you're just not at the top of your game without that. Um, and so it's really hard to explain to some patients because they, they don't know the difference. Um, because they're so used to that. But when you are used to that constant feed of proper nutrition, you really do start to notice the difference. Um, and so working it somewhere in there, if it's at lunchtime or right before lunchtime or right after lunchtime or a snack time, just so there, I, I think it's important and Jen can jump in if she wants to just from the, the nutrition side point. Um, but I really think it's important that you don't dodge that throughout the day um, and try to shut it. Plus, also, it's going to make it really hard for you to get all your formula in. Um, I, I know if I skip lunch and I don't take my formula to three, then that's affecting my dinner time one. And then I end up taking a formula right before bed, and then I can't sleep. So I just really encourage you to pace it out more accordingly <laughs> throughout the day. Um, for kids and, and adults too. I mean, it, it kind of goes across the board, really. So. It also makes it too tempting to steal your, or not steal, but 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 borrow your colleague's high protein sandwich when you're hungry at lunch if you're not full on formula, <laughs> right? So it's the other issue. Um, the last question was for Jen. Um, and so um, right now it's, not a huge problem across the board, but how would you, uh, how do you recommend balancing sports and after school activities um, and formula diet management? Yeah, so I think part of what we just talked about, right, is 
planning on having formula available, planning on having the appropriate low protein snacks available, ready to go. Uh, I think planning ahead is the key and have an emergency plan. So keeping um, sport bags packed with some non-perishable go-to low protein things. Uh, so they're always there. I think those are the two, the two things. All right. Well, um, that that is it for our questions, and it's super late on everyone's side, I think. And so, um, thank you again, everyone. Um, I'd really like to thank our panel. And actually, I'm taking over for Sarah. So, Sarah, would you like to? <laughs> okay. I'd really like to thank our panel. <laughs> uh, and also all of all of the people. We had a great uh, great group of people today, and really a, a diverse group. I mean. PKU always kind of packs the room, but that's because we are, you know, the most common of, we, I have a kid with PKU, um, the most, you know, common of the inborn errors, but we had a really diverse group of attendees today, which I think speaks to, you know, Danae asked me if um, PKU News wanted to co-sponsor this, and because she and I, and I think everyone here on this panel really believe that, you know, we're all one community, it's not about our disorders specifically and our, you know, our various treatments. Some of us have, you know, different treatments, but we all have the low protein diet and we all understand each other on a fundamental level um, because of that. And so I think it's great that we got such a, a diverse group of panelists and attendees to come together and talk about this. And I just want to thank everyone for, for giving us your Wednesday night. I, I hardly ever know what day it is, but I think it's Wednesday. <laughs> so, um, to recap, I will be sending out a link with the recording in the next um, one to two days, depending on, on how things go with the editing and uploading. Um, and that will include a bunch of additional resources and links. And for those um, who I'm speaking to in the future that will be watching this on YouTube, um, We'll have those links in the description as well. So um, we hope that everyone finds those as a resource. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us. And thank you for our panel. Um, have a wonderful night. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.